Tanya Plibersek joins me live. I will get to your portfolio in a moment. Can I first ask you about this HSU stop work action today? Do you think this concern is just confined to New South Wales? Oh, Laura, I'm sure that this is the, the case also right around Australia. Those figures from New South Wales with one hospital worker um, being assaulted every day in New South Wales hospitals are a real concern. Many of these workers are, are vulnerable. They're um, working long hours right through the night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, we're staffing our hospitals. Uh, and cleaners, um, security staff are really bearing the brunt of uh, bad behaviour from patients uh, and from members of the public. They shouldn't. They shouldn't be exposed to this sort of danger and violence in their workplace. Is this firmly in the remit of the state government or is there a role the federal government should play here when it comes to safety of workers such as these? Look, I think this really is an issue for the New South Wales state government and for state governments around the country to make sure that their staff uh, in hospitals are properly protected. Um, I would say uh, when it comes to our hospitals, we've got extraordinarily long waiting times now uh, in emergency and very long waiting times for uh, elective surgery. And I, I think, um, you know, I'd, I'd imagine that some of the frustrations that you see are caused by those very long waiting times, by the crowding you see in emergency, by issues like ramping where patients are kept uh, in ambulances because there's no bed for them in the hospital. Um, so the, the federal government has a role in properly funding our hospitals to reduce some of these pressures in our hospitals, mm. but the day-to-day -day issues around uh, protecting staff are, are firmly in state, the state government's area of responsibility. OK, I'm going to do something radical here and ask you about your own portfolio area. I was looking at some uh, data right. from Universities Australia that show yeah. um, that young people are still more likely to go to uni if they live in more wealthy suburbs in the cities um, rather than, you know, some other areas of the country. The Productivity Commission also, also showed that um, the well, Labor's policy, essentially, of uncapping university places has had mixed results and it's not done much to get people from regional areas into universities. Why the huge focus on, on uni? What's wrong with TAFE? Well, no, no, both are great. Uh, we need to have a, a strong and excellent university system and a strong and excellent TAFE system. We need both, side by side. But sadly, this government has cut both universities and TAFE. Um, what we know for sure is that work is becoming increasingly complex. Nine out of ten jobs that will be created in coming years will need a TAFE or a university qualification, not just a high school qualification. Uh, and so we need to make sure that uh, Australians have the opportunity of that education because if we're locking them out of education, we are locking them out of jobs. We saw very substantial increases in the number of students from regional and rural communities when we uncapped uh, access to universities. We saw um, students from all sorts of disadvantaged backgrounds, uh, economically disadvantaged, Indigenous, rural and remote, students with a disability. Um, all of those categories increased when we uncapped access to university uh, and all of those um, categories will suffer when we res restrict access to university education. Yeah. Look, it, it's just nuts, isn't it, that if you're a student on the, the... If you're a young person on the North Shore of Sydney, you are three times more likely to go to university than someone even on the Central Coast. If you are growing up in Brisbane, you are four times more likely to go to university than someone who's growing up in Caboolture or Deception Bay. Mm. Um, it's not right. These kids uh, in rural and regional communities are every bit as smart, they're every bit as ambitious. What they're missing out on is the opportunity of a university education. And so sure. we need to make sure they have that opportunity for university or TAFE, as you point out. But universities are profitable businesses. Is part of the problem here is that not reinvesting that profit into students and spending too much money on things like marketing? Well, I think... Um, you know, the, the marketing issue is a little bit of a furphy. It's important that universities are able to communicate a, about their courses with potential students, both in Australia and overseas. Uh, I think the, the bigger issue is that government has, for years now, um, been restricting funding to universities for students, for research. Uh, there's an education infrastructure fund. None of that money has been spent on 
uh, new buildings or resources. And there's a really great disparity between uh, the big city universities and the regional universities. They are yeah. really struggling um, in recent years to, um, to offer the quality of education that they want for their students. Well, Labor is going to review all of its policies. Does your portfolio and the promises you made at the election remain front and centre? A $17 billion increase for schools, increased funding for uh, universities. And, I mean, you're reviewing the policies that perhaps would have paid for some of that, franking credits and um, negative gearing. Are these unfunded promises at the moment? Look, you're quite right. We have said very clearly that we're reviewing all of our policies. We're not just going to roll over what we've committed to in the past. But I can tell you that education will always be front and centre for Labor because it's the best opportunity of giving an individual uh, uh, every chance in life to get a great job and, and live a good quality of life. But it's also vitally important for our economy. Mm. By investing in education, we invest in the future prosperity of our nation. So uh, you, you know that we'll always back strong investment in early childhood education, in schools, in TAFE and in universities, so that people have um, li yeah. lifelong opportunity. Well, New Start is another one, another one of those uh, things, an increase Labor is pushing for. Before the election, you said there'd be a review. Now you want the government to lift it. By how much? And is this unfunded empathy, as the Prime Minister put it? Well, I think it was a, a really unfortunate um, expression that the, the Prime Minister's used. Uh, Labor's not the only organisation calling for an increase in New Start. We're not the only people calling for an increase in New Start. Um, even, uh, you know, notable radicals like the Business Council of Australia and former Prime Minister John Howard are calling for an increase in New Start. Um, I, I don't know many people who think they could live on $14,500 a yeah. year. Uh, New Start's just a bit less than that. Uh, it is now at a stage where people can't afford to look for work. They're, they're just surviving on Newstart. They can't afford the transport to get to work. They can't afford a clean shirt um, for the job interview. We are trapping people in poverty by the very low rate. And we haven't just plucked a figure out of the air. Um, our policy before the, the election figure? is to have a thorough review. Well, we, we, we don't... Uh, this is exactly the point. We're not just going to make a figure up. Our policy before the election was to have a thorough review of the adequacy of New Start, right. where we would take a scientific approach to, um, to you know, the, co the quantum of increase that is necessary for people to uh, live adequately on New Start while they're searching for work. Um, we think it's important that the government lift the rate of New Start, and we would be very happy to participate with them in an analysis of what a reasonable rate would be. Just finally, can I ask you about Raheem Kassam? He's coming out to speak at a Conservative conference. He's the editor of Breitbart. Some of your colleagues have called him a career bigot. Why should he be banned? Well, we're all for freedom of speech. We think that there's a robust uh, contest of ideas that is perfectly appropriate um, for Australia. What we don't like are people who are... Uh, vilifying groups in our community and uh, encouraging um, the exclusion and vilification uh, of those groups. And I think uh, th this fellow, if you look at his past comments, falls well within that latter category. He has apologised for some of those comments. Oh, well, I, I, look, I, I don't think it's worth going through everything he's uh, said in history, but he's got um, racist, mm. sexist, anti-Muslim... Uh, a record of vilifying um, groups in our community that I don't think is particularly productive to, uh, to be winding that stuff up here in Australia. So you're obviously not at all swayed by Donald Trump Jr's tweeting about this individual overnight? Well, there's a great example of everybody having a right to their opinion. <laughs> uh, he's got a right to his opinion. We'll leave it there. Tanya Plivisek, appreciate your time. Thanks, Laura.